at Ben, um, a colleague of Sagar and Wolfgang and Marcel worked in Forest Capital. And um, we already had the chance to talk a lot about regulation and about different aspects of technology. And uh, I have the honor to host the last panel of our today's session, which is more about the investor and startup landscape of Web3 as of today. And um, we have four esteemed panelists uh, who joined the discussion today, three seasoned fund managers and one founder. To, it's a little bit uh, unequal balance, but um, you have to make up for the startup side. And uh, leave it to me, I'm excited. <laughs> exactly. So uh, let's start with, uh, first of all, we have Ashok. Um, he comes here on behalf of, uh, we originally had invited uh, Pranav from Woodstock Capital. He couldn't make it, unfortunately, on short notice. So uh, Ashok was kind enough to um, chip in for him. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, he also works with Pranav as he's an active advisor at Agna in Institutional Fund of Funds. Uh, next, we have the founder in our panel, Hoon. He, is, uh, he was the co-founder of uh, Asta Network, a uh, well-regarded uh, smart contract platform in the Japanese ecosystem. Maybe it rings a bell for some of you. And he is also founder of a small indie game development studio. Uh, next, we have Feo from um, Target Global. He is actually the head of digital assets at Target Global. It's a huge fund with more than $3 billion uh, under management in total, and he is spearheading the crypto hedge fund side, so to speak, of the fund. He is also a board member and advisor at Fortina Capital, a well-known European venture capital fund um, for the topic related to Web3 topics. And uh, last but not least, we have Vinny from Dubai. Uh, he is the partner um, at Cypher Capital. It's a crypto fund with more than 100 million assets under management. Uh, they invest in some of the earliest stages of tokens. Um, many, many of the token names you probably will uh, be familiar with that they have invested in sometimes in the earliest days. And uh, yeah, that rounded up. I would suggest we start, maybe, Winnie, we start with you. Maybe you can tell the audience a little bit more about what you guys do as a fund, um, which stages you focus on, and what are most important questions for you to decide in which companies are interesting for investments and which ones are not. Again, as a fund, Cypher Capital is a $100 million fund, uh, purely crypto native. I only believe in tokens. Uh, yeah, this is very controversial. Last year, everyone was saying it's all about equity. I said this is because SEC put up a case against Ripple. Next year, you guys will be again talking about tokens. In fact, I remember, I don't know if there's a recording here, uh, I think on stage I clearly said, guys, cycles keep on coming, FTXs and Mt. Goxes keep on dying, but you have to understand that Bitcoin has some use case. That use case doesn't go, the markets will go back up and people in Latin America and when people in Africa start understanding what value USDT gets to the market, this will go back up, you know. And, you know, people were saying, like, I've heard it in, from the morning that SEC and, uh, you know, these uh, ETFs going on, Guys, I would love that U.S. keeps out of it because, you know, every time they sneeze, the whole world catches a, a cold. So I would love actual use case countries to get on board with these things. Highly controversial views, but yeah, that's my view. Now, when it comes to investment, you know, I think uh, I've been a founder for 15 years. What is exactly needed is a great team. You know, ideas pivot. You know, what you start with is not sometimes what you end up with. Uh, teams that have persistence, team that, team that has a vision. I think backers are critical. You want backers who will uh, be there when you are down and out. Uh, I think I've seen Yat backing his startups even in the, like I remember some of the deals that we have been part of. He's always backed them up and there are some found investors who really back them, like Sequa does that and there are other ones as well. So the team is important, what they are doing is important. I think the idea counts as well, you know, the clarity on how they will develop it up. Everyone wants to go to the moon, but no one has a clue how to even power up a rocket. So I look at, you know, that's where the team part comes. Do they have the capacity and the capability to do something like that? Then finally, you know, it's, I think this is what 50% of it is. And then the other 50% is the market dynamics. An amazing idea, an amazing product, and a bad market. I'm trying to be good with my words. Well, it's an amazing market and bad market can actually make even great teams go down. So this, this is overall what I look at while investing. All right. Um, Feo, does that uh, resonate with your funds thesis or what, what would you say is most important aspects about what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I think we, um, uh, so I run an early stage venture token fund for Target, which is a mouthful, but 
similar to, to you, we sort of focus on tokens. Uh, we think uh, tokens are kind of you know an evolution in financial instruments that have combined you know multiple uh, asset traits into one because essentially we have a single digital, single programmable. Um, and and the other part is we uh, in terms of the stage of investment we um, uh, we focus on I guess our strategy is best described as, as latest venture. Uh, so we work with early stage projects that. Um, whose token is liquid, and so it's typically done in one or two private rounds, and then they launch a token. Uh, and we like to get involved at that stage. Um, one, because um, I guess uh, often the teams are you know, uh, very technically versed, uh, but they have a token that's listed, and so they're subject to sort of public market dynamics. Uh, and they often have a lot to learn when it comes to, uh, you know, to general sort of corporate finance um, you know, basics uh, and how to sort of go about you know, these public markets. Um, and the other part is we think it's actually a risk reward sweet spot, uh, something that you know is, is new when the crypto is introduced really, because we can sort of seek uh, venture like returns, but with the benefit of, of liquidity, right? Uh, or at least you know a semblance of liquidity if you look at the stuff that we invest in. Um, and the other part is um, you can uh, track these projects, the progress in real time, right? So you're not at the mercy of let's say a good VP finance CFO of some you know startup. Uh, you could basically interact with the smart contracts of these protocols that you invest in and pull the, the data uh, in real time basis. Um, to answer sort of your, your question, I think um, we like to work with teams where you know they're at least a little bit receptive to what we have to say. My background is in, is in track buying, uh, and so uh, you know we, 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 from a thematic standpoint, we tend to focus on infra and DeFi uh, projects, and where these uh, sort of early stage teams are sort of happy to listen to us, where we can say. Look, if you were to guide the market uh, on you know, these particular KPIs, there would be a much better understanding of, of your product and the value you thereof, and therefore uh, of the value of the overall network. Maybe a follow-up question. Where, where would you make the distinction between being a crypto hedge fund and a crypto VC if you're investing in early stage projects? Yeah, so, so we are a bit of a, a hybrid in the sense that uh, we are, uh, from an investment standpoint, a strategy standpoint, we are more of a VC. We invest for the long run, so we're long run lead, and we want to be sort of, you know, the kind of the, the capital partner um, for these businesses after the kind of the venture stage, you know, after the pre seed the seed rounds, when ventures, you know, venture capital funds, not check out, but they move on to other things. We are sort of able to, um, you know, kind of manage the position, help them get through, you know, in public markets. Uh, that being said, our fund is uh, structured like a hedge fund, so. Uh, you know, we uh, we provide you know it's an open-ended fund. You can subscribe on a monthly basis, and you will get a monthly NAV statement, uh, something you wouldn't get in a typical sort of a, a closed-end uh, venture uh, structure. Cool. Um, who, for you on the founder side, in your experience, you've been involved in many different ventures. Um, from a founder perspective, well, how do you choose a good investor? Like besides the the money, especially if you have different offers from different investors, what's founder? What's important for a founder for a founder in this question? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, and by the disclaimer, guys, I just recovered from my cold, and you know how you still have that dry cough left, so I might talk a little bit. It's also because you guys are so breathtaking. I don't have enough breath for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, in terms of founder um, investors, so I guess it also depends on the context of what kind of project they're raising, the nature of your project. Uh, in my case, um, I've done both for Astra, uh, Astra Network, the, the protocol that everyone in Polkadot, which would be naturally a token race, and uh, for TeamStep, which is a little bit more nuanced than that, because we are creating an engagement platform for Indian Studio, where you, know, uh, you tokenize user interaction uh, that they perform, uh, whatever action they perform in game or outside of game, and just sort of connect them seamlessly. Uh, and now, the thing is, with this platform, you don't really need a cryptocurrency, at least not in the early stage. We want to focus on the product first, the uh, value first, and then token later. And now here, uh, the white investor uh, becomes a problem because as uh, the gentleman here, like uh, both of said, like crypto is kind of king, right? Token, you invest in token. And if I say, no, we're not going to token, like uh, maybe it's at some point, yeah, but uh, we feel like we should have a product first and then token later. But when the investors are saying like, no, we want token first, product later, then that's when it becomes a challenge, right? So. Uh, for us, we want to find um, an investor who really shares the mindset, like not just in terms of the, uh, the possibility of what that product can do, but the implication of the vision behind the team. What are they really trying to achieve through their project? Are they trying to show something that no one else, uh, no one else have ever done before? 
uh, or is it just going to be another like you know a typical project but with a higher APR uh, or maybe like you know better yields uh, or maybe the lower transaction fees? Understood. And Ashok, um, I think you are involved in the fund of funds at the moment as an advisor, but it seems like you have a very seasoned investor career as well. So where do you put yourself right now, by the way? Um, do you do institutional fund of funds for venture capital funds or hedge funds, or what, what do you spend your time on as an investor in the Web3 space right now? Uh, first of all, I'm trying to fill in the big shoes of uh, here, so excuse me uh, for that. And you would also like take interest calls when you. Um, so uh, I think if from the context of Agna, um, it, it, the focus is uh, non-crypto. The focus is on deep tech. Uh, the four areas that we are looking at are um, climate tech, uh, defense, uh, AI, and any deep tech with uh, very real-world um, applications. And that's, the, that's the idea. Uh, and with that perspective in mind, uh, venture capital is, 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 is what we are looking at. It's going to be a VC fund. Uh, focus on uh, early stage, early early stage startups, which are uh, like in a very sense core fundamental work in this area. I mean, maybe that's a good introduction to rely then to um, distinguish. I mean, many come from the traditional venture capital space from the Web two space, and I think there's a lot of distinct differences, especially to Web three space. So if you say if you say you also focus on like let's say more Web two traditional business models as early stage investments, but you also know the crypto side. What would be the key distinct, like how would you explain to a venture capitalist who has not had exposure to the Web3 space, what are the most important factors for them to understand from your perspective? So um, venture capitalists who are interested in investing in Web3? Um, it can be both, it can also be hedge fund, but like, or maybe to add more context, I mean I would argue in the traditional Web2 venture capital world, there's this system of like startup factory where you kind of bounce from round to round and each round goes with certain milestones, certain metrics. And in that context, I think there's a, and we will discuss it, uh, about this a little bit more in detail, but like let's say the traditional product market fit in Web2 space is you have a SaaS company and you make a million in revenue uh, on an annual basis. And if you don't have that numbers to show for, you don't even need to reach out to a Series A investor. In the crypto space, this can look very differently when you raise a token model. Yeah. So maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, the crypto, and I've been, I've been kind of working in both areas. Uh, I come from a core mechanical engineering, nuclear engineering kind of fundamental background, but I've gradually moved into the, 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 the free space. And it's kind of a strange world, right? Um, when you come out with tokens, or you, know, you already are flush with, uh, with funds, and uh, being laser focused on innovation and making sure that you have good product market fit may not be that urgent a need when you have that kind of you know, um, uh, fund available. But in case of uh, core deep tech, uh, when you are doing um, work, say, on uh, creating a new hydrogen fuel, for example, uh, a rocket engine, or something like that, you need to have a very, a very clear idea on what your development stages are, what kind of funds are required at certain stages, what your uh, delivery schedule is going to look like, and how you're going to take it to production, because there is a lot of difference between creating a prototype and generating a technology, and then taking it to production for you know, mass uh, adoption. Um, then there is also uh, a thought that has to go in that, you know, I've proven the technology, I have understood how the market dynamics work, dynamics work, and I'm taking it to market, but then there are logistic issues involved, because you're not producing very easy and things. You know, how do you solve those logistic issues? So you may, as an example, just to take it forward, right? You may create a jet engine that is fueled by hydrogen, but now the hydrogen economics has to work, and the supply chain for hydrogen needs to build, uh, and needs to build up to, to various points where it needs to be up. So those are the issues. Those are very hardcore kind of issues that one needs to really deep dive into, um, and that's. Uh, that's challenging um, as compared to you know um, a world where you're coming out of layer one or you know uh, a layer two on top of something which is already existing. I think I think the challenges in deep tech are, are very real, um, and the fund flow uh, doesn't happen as uh, as early as it happens in web two. That's that's one clear distinction that I have between that. Yeah, if I could just uh, comment on that. I think uh, when um, 
you know, Web2 investors looking to enter the Web3 space. And, um, the obvious comment is everything is different. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's highly volatile, but I'd like to sort of highlight one aspect, uh, one of many, which is um, time to profitability. If you look at um, traditional uh, Web2 uh, you know, tech businesses, take uh, you know, Palantir, take a, a Uber, take a Robinhood, Palantir took a number of years to so market the systems were you know, uh, quite capital intensive. Uh, Uber, I think, took, uh, took 10 years, and Robinhood about eight years. And we with the fund, we invest in early stage businesses that you know, have a token that you know, becomes liquid maybe two, three years post inception. It's kind of like the business doing an IPO, not maybe five, 10, 15 years like a traditional SaaS business would, but two years basically. And these businesses, whilst they, I think the, the risk um, profile is, is, is very different. Uh, in traditional tech, um, you're worried about you know, finance, financing. Uh, businesses you know, need, to do, uh, you know, need to raise money over multiple rounds, or you know, it's an up round every time. With um, Web3, you have a business that may do one or two raises, and then they can achieve you know, break even or profitability within two, a th two to three year time frame. So from a financial standpoint, they are heavily de-risked. Obviously, there are other risks, you know, technological risk and you know, smart contract risk, and these things can be hacked and you know, still very experimental. So I think the set of risk parameters is, you know, uh, it is very different, you know, comparing Web two to Web three. I think the time for profitability is something that in, when investors are looking at the space, need to sort of better understand because the network effects and the operating leverage that you know a, a, a Web three protocol, a business that is built on the blockchain can achieve is second to none, and this basically, uh, you know, can't be done in, in, in an you know, off-chain way. Well, my advice uh, for Web2 people going into Web3 is, look, if, if there's a dog look cute, uh, then buy it. <laughs> but uh, jokes aside, I guess, for founder perspective as well, I would definitely say that um, token, the nature of investing in token versus stocks or equity is very different, because equity, at least the principles, is that you are investing it because of the dividends that would pay through the profitability of the company, right? But in the case of token, that's not really the case because you're not, there's no, uh, well, first of all, it's not uh, securities, right? I mean, depends on who you ask, but uh, it's, uh, it's really not about the dividends or the profitability of the organization, but more like the demand that product is able to generate, the traction it has, the momentum, uh, so many different variables. So it opens up a whole new opportunity. So I would also say, like, uh, to add on to your point, like, it's, um, it's, it's looking at a different perspective. It's not replacing anything, it's not better than equity or anything. It's just, another way to look at businesses and, and traction. So if we stick to analogy um, of a Series A company needs to show for at least a million ARR, otherwise don't even show up at the door of the Series A investor in the Web2 space, what would be a comparable analogy to that in the Web3 space for Series A, and is there one? Um, maybe, Winnie, what, what are your thoughts on that? Again, you know, just getting from the points which were mentioned earlier, I think in Web2 space, someone comes up with an idea and goes and scams his mommy, papi, dad and gets some money out, makes a presentation, goes to an angel investor, does $100 revenue, does a Series A, does a million dollar Series B. And eight years later, after hundreds of thousands of users using their product, it takes an IPO. This is how real world works. Because these people have either booked a cab from you or uh, uh, gotten some food from you. While in crypto, in one month you have a seed round done, in two months you have a private round done, maybe there's no product at all still, and you have an idea in six months. In a bull run, it's within one month. So basically you are shortening the period of eight years into six months. So but without a product. Yeah, I don't, so this, is, this, is, this whole thing he's been discussing with me about product market fit. My question to people here is, four million, uh, sorry, 4% of the world population, 400, if you see crypto.com uh, report, 400 million wallets. That is four, as if I assume 1% is one wallet, 4% of world's population is in crypto. 90% have no clue what Bitcoin is, what Ethereum is, they're just buying green candles. They have neither lent, neither borrowed, neither booked anything over there on crypto. Less than 1% of the world's population is in there. Where is the users right now? Users will come in 2030, the founders who are real right now, like you know, I've been talking to Vijay from Bitcrunch, they need to build their treasury for 2030. They need, if their annual burn rate is $5 million, they need to get $60 million USDT in their reserves. Because in 2030, when 15% of the world population is there, they are the next Googles and they are the next Facebooks of the world. Right now, it's just 
probably five, ten million users at the moment, you know. So still in the 90s of the internet.com era. Well. Yeah, we're starting up and understand, you know, we have companies which within three months of launching are sitting at 18 billion dollars. Do you know how much effort, blood, sweat it takes to even make a single billion dollar company? And I don't want to name any companies. I've invested in them, but they're sitting at 18 billion market cap in less than three months of launch. In respect of time, I would say let's uh, wrap it up with a final question for each of you. Uh, short statement, please. Um, if you look back the last two years, um, what were your, so to speak, biggest, like if you want to talk about it, your biggest failures from investment standpoint, doesn't need to be a personal life, and uh, your biggest learnings resulting from that, that you would try to avoid in the future? Uh, I think uh, for me, it's been a learning experience. There's no failures. I met a lot of amazing people in the last two years. Uh, you know, everyone, you know, they, there was this term, tourist VCs, you know, people who come in the bull run. We went against it. We actually went out and met everyone, had great conversations without expectations. And I think we are in the best space available, a growing asset class. In 2030, people in this room will be known for what they've been doing right now. Yeah, I think um, for me, especially in the last uh, two years, um, my background is in track five, so I try, where possible, to apply, you know, kind of, um, you know, best practices in, in, in track five and, and uh, when it comes to, you know, evaluating tokens and projects and, and, and evaluation. And I think, you know, we, it, kind of for track five, we like fundamentals, right? And uh, I think my learning was the last two years in the bear market, nobody gives a shit about fundamentals. And uh, the market is basically extremely opportunistic and, and narrative driven, right? And I think the, um, the goal for an investor in this space is to sort of be able to match, you know, narrative and fundamentals, uh, and then you're probably, you know, you're, you're, you're looking good. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, longer term, as this space matures, as it becomes more institutionalized, um, people will start to value some of these assets, like you would value, you know, equities or other, you know, traditional assets. Uh, but, you know, we're not, you know, some, some of that's happening, and, and some of that has yet to happen. And I think, uh, you know, keeping a bearing on sort of, you know, narrative, Yeah, of course. Uh, founder, uh, founder perspective. So, um, well, I guess I'll just use this platform just to have a slight uh, self plug in that uh, we're raising, uh, we're going to see from the process right now. We're raising funds. So, if you're interested in what we're doing, we'd love to talk more. And this is where I guess the mistake part also comes in because uh, while uh, I was uh, working with Soto for Tigre Astar, we did have a lot of mistakes uh, early on, especially when it comes to fundraising because we started the company in Japan. Uh, in Tokyo, we wanted the goal was to be listed uh, in, in the Tokyo uh, Stock Exchange Fund. It had an IPO, not an ICO. Uh, but for a crypto market, especially in Japan at the time, uh, 2019, uh, that was a big mistake because Japan is, uh, they, they were really backward when it comes to crypto in Asia. Now it's, uh, the narrative is different, as we saw from the previous panels as well. Japan and Asia is like, uh, they, they, they change their national strategy because uh, this, and uh, the reason, one reason is because of ASTAR. When we were quite successful in Europe, uh, especially the dev field, we found out that, yeah, we could uh, use this as a case to uh, go back to Japan and say that, hey, you guys are losing a lot of talent. Uh, so understanding which jurisdiction, which country makes sense for your business model uh, and find the right investors who are able to really support you and give you advice on that kind of stuff. I think that was really important uh, learning for us. Um, I have a, like a core belief that innovation happens in constraints and then the results are sustained. I think last two years kind of proved that. Um, at a personal level, as well as when I look at you know, look at the larger perspective, that I find that uh, the, the downturn is important to to shake up the boat a little bit and get get the get the you know crap out of the out of the deck. Um, I think that that happened and that was good. Um, I also realized that you know it's, it's at a personal level it's, it's probably better to have one one foot in Web three and one foot in Web two. Um, so. I think that that made sense as well, and I think um, you know from from Arjuna Foundation's perspective, I, I realized that you know, there is um, there is understanding that deep tech and core engineering uh, are the foundation, and we need to build on that foundation. I think Web three is one application of that you know deep tech technology, and we need not forget that we can't isolate it from overall use. But when you take even Web three technology to actual users and as any person, then five percent or ten percent of the population, uh, world population, starts using it. It's kind of solving some core problem for the users. 
I think that's important to understand that in that case, that has to be based on the very sound in, in engineering foundation in Indian science. All right, great. Thanks for, sh uh, yes? I, Wolf told me not to use the F word or the S word or anything, so I was very nice today. <laughs> Normally I'm, is that true, right? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Vinny. Yeah. Ten, ten bucks. Ten bucks. So thanks for sharing your insights. Uh, if anyone wants to get to know these gentlemen and learn more about their funds, then uh, we have a networking session for the next hour. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, everyone. And, uh,